Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Wake Forest Presbyterian Church. My name is Janet Briley, and I am the Director of Youth Ministries. And I wanted to just share some youth updates with you this morning. Um, our summer has looked a lot different than it typically does since we were not able to take our trips like we usually do. Um, but nevertheless, we've been able to connect in other ways. Uh, just last week, both middle school and high school youth on different days came and worked in the garden. Um, they are a part of a new project addition to the garden. Um, the, the bank right beside the garden is going to turn into a food forest. It will eventually have um, apple trees and blueberry bushes and grapevines and lots of, of fruit bearing trees and bushes and the youth are a big part of making that happen. So last week they cleared the bank and they were socially distanced and they wore masks and long pants in the heat and they did not complain once. It was wonderful. So um, we had that opportunity to, to have a mission project together and, and be in person even though we were um, socially distanced. We are working on details for a food drive that we will need your help with. Stay tuned for details coming up in the next few weeks in leaflets on exactly what foods we will need. But basically the youth will stand, again, socially distanced in the um, circle of the church and you will just drive through and drop off your food. Um, simple, so stay tuned for details on that. Uh, our youth leadership team is getting ready to have their first kickoff meeting for the year where they will plan our youth theme and different activities for the year and they will get to help be creative in this new era of youth ministries that we're in. What does it look like? How do we still make youth ministries meaningful and special for everybody? So we're really looking forward to our youth leadership team being a big part of that. Um, they are a great group of, of high school youth that are on that team this year and we're looking forward to, to what they come up with. Uh, our confirmation team has been working hard. The teaching team has been working really hard um, on ways to make confirmation meaningful and special again this year as it always is. Uh, our youth advisors are working hard all of a, all of this via Zoom. We're all getting really good at Zoom. We know that, <laughs> um, but everybody is working really hard to to come up with ways that that we can all be um, in, involved. And um, we sent out a survey for youth and youth parents. There were two different surveys, and um, just to get a comfort level, so that. Are you ready to come back outside socially distanced or is that not comfortable yet? Do you want to remain virtual? So we wanted to have that feedback as we move forward and plan for what this year is going to look like in youth ministries. So lots of great things going on, um, new and different, and that's okay. And it's exciting. So stay tuned for uh, lots of updates in the youth world. Thank you. Friends of Wake Forest Presbyterian, I've got a special announcement I want to make to you this morning about Christmas Angel, one of the missions of the church. Yes, I know that Christmas is over five months away, but in the spirit of Christmas in July, we wanted to lift this mission of the church before you this morning. In December, Dana Wills and volunteers, they go out and purchase Christmas presents for families in the local community who can't afford them for their children. These families are identified through Wake County Social Services. Now due to COVID, a lot of plans that would typically be in place have had to change. So we're asking for financial donations for this mission. The reason that we're doing this in July, on top of the fact that Christmas in July has a nice ring to it, is because having these monies a few months in advance, it gives the team plenty of time to plan, purchase, wrap, and deliver the presents so that the whole mission is already completed by the time that Christmas Day gets here. So you're invited to go to the wakeforestpres.org webpage, click Give at the top of the page, and in the drop-down menu, you're invited to select Christmas Angel to help support this mission. Thank you, friends in Christ. Good morning, you fine people at Wake Forest Presbyterian Church, and all of those of you who are... Um, watching us online. We're just so glad you're here. Welcome. And I hope you feel at home, even though you probably are home, and um, that you, this service will be a meaningful one for you. We are having communion today. 
And we have it here, and all you need to do if you have not had communion with us virtually is just follow our lead up here in the front. Um, make sure you have a piece of bread and something to drink along with that and to be able to dip the elements in. And I'm glad that you could join us. Um, I find that this is a way that I feel like I am with you, um, even though technically, physically, we are not. Technically, we are, aren't we? That's for sure. Yeah. Mm. Um, I have been gone for a couple of weeks on vacation, which was very interesting. It had to be a staycation because we couldn't go to Germany to see our grandson, and we couldn't go to Miami to see our other grandchildren. So we went to the beach for a day, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but vacation was strange which is exactly what all of us are feeling right now when we look at the condition of the world and, and where we are sequestered in our homes. But remember this, in Christ we are at home, in our hearts and in our souls, and this gives us hope. And I hope that this service of worship will be one that provides you with hope and refreshment and fulfillment and peace. So I'm really glad you're here. Pastor John? All right. Worshiping friends, I have a COVID update for Wake Forest Presbyterian. The Reopen Task Force has been working for many weeks, assessing the current and, of course, ever-changing climate and what this means for the ministries of the church, the whole thing. They made a recommendation to session in July, and session approved it. So as of yesterday, adult small groups that want to meet outside at, here at the church campus can start to do so, if they book the date and the time with Renee, Renee's got detailed instructions about the locations and the guidelines for meeting together at a distance. Youth and children's ministries are also strategizing on their ministry activities, and you can track those updates in the weekly emails that Janet and Catherine send out. And if you're not on those emails, hey, now's a great time to sign up for them. Initially, a target date for the first Sunday in September was to be the return to in-person modified worship. But, friends, with COVID's continual increase in deaths and hospitalizations and cases confirmed, that motion approved by session had to be changed and amended and session voted on a new motion. And that is, a date in the future to be determined will be the target for returning mm -hmm. to worship. I hear stories from you all when you run into each other in town about how much you miss church, how much you want to get back. And friends, we, I, all of us miss having church too. But to be stewards of everyone's safety, the task force session, leadership, staff are taking this very seriously mm -hmm. as we should. So please continue to keep vigil with us as we patiently assess how to be church in this ever-changing landscape. And I offer prayers that all of us continue to stay safe in these COVID times. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, let us center ourselves as we hear these gathering words and prepare for worship. They come from the poet Mary Oliver, titled, Don't Hesitate. Mm -hmm. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate, <laughs> give into it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not often very kind, and much can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back, that sometimes something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Hmm. That's good, yeah. And friends, let us join our voices wherever we find ourselves and be united in our hearts and spirits as we sing the following hymn.
Hello, my young friends. I hope you all are doing well on this Sunday morning. Um, it has been really, really hot outside the last couple weeks, hasn't it? And if you're lucky, you have had the opportunity to jump into a nice cold pool or maybe a lake or maybe run out into the water in the ocean. And I want you to stop and close your eyes for just a second. And if you've been able to do one of those activities recently, I want you to think about how refreshing that felt on a really hot day to jump into that body of water that was just waiting to make you feel cooler and more relaxed, right? That's what water does for us on hot days like we've had so much in the last couple weeks. Water is refreshing. When you're super hot and thirsty outside, you drink a cold cup of water and all of a sudden everything feels a little bit better, doesn't it? Well, Pastor Rebecca is going to be preaching about water today, but not just any water. She is going to be preaching from a very, very well-known Psalm, Psalm 23. You have heard it. I promise you've heard it once upon a time. And it talks about how God leads us beside the still waters. It's the, one of the many references to the idea of God as living water. Mm -hmm. And what I wanna offer you this morning is the idea, which is a weird one, if we don't understand what we're talking about, the idea of living water being the idea that when we give God the chance, God refreshes our hearts and our souls and our spirits, just like that pool does on a super hot day or just like that first sip of a nice cold glass of water and all of this heat. That is what living water is. When we give God the opportunity to settle down into our hearts, especially in those really difficult moments when our hearts are hurting or our hearts are angered, by things, that living water idea is that God has the ability to refresh our hearts and our spirits so that we feel rejuvenated to go out and serve the world in the way that God wants us to. So my friends, I want you listening this morning to Pastor Rebecca about this idea of living water. And I want you to remember how good it felt to take that really cold sip of ice water on a hot day or jump into that cool ocean wave when you were all hot and sweaty. Remember those feelings and try to think about God. God inviting you into a refreshing new sense of understanding of how to love yourself and one another better. I want to offer you a quote before we pray together. It's by Wendell Berry. He's a poet and an author and one of my favorite people to read sometimes. And he said, Do unto those downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. That should sound pretty familiar. He changed around some words, but I like it because it has to do with water. It is the idea that when you are full of the living water of God's love, the people that you come in contact with down the road are going to get a better piece of your love, just as if there are people who are filled with living water of God's love up the road who meet you, you're getting a better piece of them. So water is super important, my friends. It helps us live, but living water helps us love. So will you pray with me for a little bit of love and living water today? Let's pray. I'll say it, then you say it. Dear God, dear God, dear God thank you for your living water. Thank, thank you, you for your, your living water. water. That doesn't just refresh our bodies. That, that doesn't, doesn't just refresh, refresh our, our bodies. bodies. It rejuvenates our very spirits. It rejuvenates our very spirits. So we can keep going. So, so we, we can, can keep, keep going. going in the heat of fear, in the, in the heat, heat of fear, or anger or hatred, or anger or hatred, knowing that your love, knowing that your love is enough for us, is enough, is enough for us, and so we can go love each other. So, so we, we can go, go love, love each, each other. other. Amen. 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 Thank you, my friends. Go be living water to someone today. Mwah. 
worshiping friends. In the faithful hands of Christ, our little is multiplied to feed many. Come now, let us offer our loaves and our fishes to Christ who said, bring them here to me. So let us worship God with the tithes and the offerings of our lives. Worshiping friends, I invite you to join your hearts and minds with me in prayer. Let us pray. We thank you, gracious God, that you have empowered us to participate in the miraculous, multiplying ministry of your Son. Receive now these gifts you have provided us out of your abundance, that your miracle ministry may multiply to satisfy the hunger of this world today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, my dears, um, today our passage of scripture comes from Psalm 23. This is a psalm that even those who are unchurched generally have a good clue about what it says. I'm only going to read the first three verses of Psalm 23, and I invite you, as best as your memory will allow, to say it with me in whatever translation you are most familiar with. So together, let us hear God's word. The Lord, the Lord is, is my, my shepherd, shepherd, I shall not want. He leads, makes, me, makes me lie down in green pastures. pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
and thank you for that. Poetry. A lot of scripture is poetry. It's often identified as uh, wisdom literature. But of course, the book in the Bible that I think is the most familiar as a book of poetry is found in the book of Psalms. Much and many of the Psalms were written and then put to music. Some of them are even identified as anthems or hymns. So it describes um, many, many different emotions and, and feelings of whatever the writer of the Psalms, and there were several, including King David, who we're very familiar with, um, they, they were sung, and they were sung and known in such a familiar way that if I were to say a line, the rest of the congregation would join in. They were powerful. I think that... Um, the ones that are put to hymns, any kind of poetry actually, affects us on a level that is very spiritual and sometimes it surprises us. I will never forget the hymn, A Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And the whole congregation in that little sanctuary at First Presbyterian in Apopka, Florida, burst into song without even using their hymn books of Blessed Assurance at my mother's memorial service. And I cannot hear or sing that hymn without thinking and going right back into the presence of that sanctuary as we celebrated my mother's life. And of course, I now say that is one of my favorite hymns. The words are powerful. I'm not going to sing it for you here, but poetry is a voice. And it's a common voice that we can find ourselves connected to deeply and in, in a spiritual way and in a heartfelt way. I mean, we often know um, lyrics to songs and to prayers, like the Lord's Prayer. We, we know that by heart, and it has a rhythm to it, almost sung. And many songs, ha many songs, ha poems have been written of the Lord's Prayer for singing as a congregation. I really want us to do that. You know, I think that would be a, a fabulous exercise. Um, they're the free verse kind of, of poetry. And I had a friend said that free verse really isn't poetry because it doesn't <laughs> rhyme. I think y'all have probably heard that too. Um, but it is poetry, often powerful. Why? Because it comes from the heart. And I know some great free verse poets out there. Poetry is full of emotion. The best poetry is honest John and I were listening to a song before the service, and, and it's a prayer, and it's poetry, and it's so deeply honest that it's powerful. It connects to our souls, even when we don't even recognize it as poetry. It has a power that stirs us, and this is important, to a response to that lyric. Now, there is a um, great deal that is disturbing us at the moment in the world today. You know, Derek and I, we often discuss words, which is what we were discussing prior to the service here. <laughs> Catherine and I were. Um, and so we, we pay attention to words and how they're put together and where the inflection lies and it just changes the whole meaning of something. But... Derek found the, the lyrics to, um, what's his name, Don Henley, used to be with the Eagles, and he wrote The Heart of the Matter, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that most of you know that one very well. And I'm not going to sing that to you either, but there's some words in there that are just so powerful, that are so pertinent to exactly where we find ourselves today. And I want to I read these to you. These times are so uncertain it goes. There's a yearning undefined. People filled with rage. We all need a little tenderness. How can love survive in such a graceless age? And the more I know, the less I understand. And all the things I thought I'd figured out, I have to learn again. I've been trying to get down to the heart of the matter. But everything changes, and my friends seem to scatter. 
But I think it's about forgiveness. Now that's a pretty description of where we find ourselves in the world we live in today. It's really rather timeless, which is what good poetry is supposed to be made of. But it brings to my imagination at the same time a vision of where I'd like to be in the midst of all the trials and tribulations of our time. And, and of course, it's found in the Bible. It's a psalm. It's a poem that suggested, suggests a healing prayer in and of itself. And most of us do. We know it by heart. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. <laughs> and isn't that the truth? Catherine alluded to it in her time with our young disciples. Made you close your eyes, which is exactly what I am suggesting now. And what I do from time to time when I feel great tension and, and pressure in my own heart and life. On my vacation, we got away for a day and we went to the beach where we visited with friends on Emerald Island. And we walked down the beach and we sat on the edge of the water and listened to the gentle lapping of the sea. They weren't still like they are in the psalm, but even then it stilled our souls. It offered a real sense of peace and restoration. And the words of the psalm were running through my mind as I closed my eyes and listened. I thought about what a gift the gentle flowing water is to our souls. It helped us to be still. It reminded me of a flowing brook as it moves along the rocks on a mountain stream. Water. Living water. And when I was little, there were, there were five of us, of course you know that, but the older four, we were in Helen, Georgia, and that was a, a small town that was before the um, cousins came in and, and redid it in an alpine theme. It was old Helen. My father and mother had lived there um, way back in the late 40s, right after they finished with seminary. And the, new, the little church that you find there was one that my father built while he was there. And that's another story for another sermon. But Helen meant a great deal to them. And my grandparents made a summer home there. And we would go to visit them, and my parents would reminisce about all the wonderful things about the mountains. Well, my dad thought it would be a good thing for the older five of us, which were Roy, Rachel, Rebecca, and Joe, that we were 14, 12, 10, and 8. All right. He thought it'd be a great idea to introduce us to the Appalachian Trail. That wasn't too far from there, and... And so we didn't have anything to say about it. We were going to trek five miles there back again. And, and he thought it would be something that we needed to have as a good experience. And we made sure it wouldn't be forgettable, that's for sure. As soon as we started on that hike, which to us seemed like it was straight up, we whined, we complained, we talked about how tired we were and our, our legs were sore and we were just so thirsty daddy we need something to drink and we were hot and bothered I think my sister even pointed out what a stupid waste of time it was oh I said stupid in church but it was as far as I was concerned as well we all agreed with her she was the only one who had strength enough to to say it well we had not brought water we blamed our dad for that as well and along our way though we came alongside a sheer rock face and on that rock face you could see little streams of water coming out of the rock itself and and dribbling down the side of the rock and one stream of drip kind of connected to another and at the bottom there was a little ledge and the water would kind of spill out and so my dad said here take your hands 
and, and put them under there and collect the water and you can drink it. We said, oh, no, we're not going to drink that water. It's so dirty. He said, no, no, you got you to gotta do this. And so we all put our hands under there and we collected the water and we drank it with our filthy little hands. And I have never tasted anything so delicious in my entire life. It was awesome. And as we gathered more and more water to drink, our father took it upon himself to tell us about the life cycle of a drop of water, which we really didn't pay much attention to, but that how it falls, descends into the ground, and the rocks do absorb it, and it's a natural filter, and it squeezes that water out from the rock itself, and it flows down. And what sets it apart from Every other kind of water is that it's pure and tasteless. It has no smell, but it's cold and it's fresh and it truly yeah, restored our bodies and our hearts. And we kept on hiking, looking forward to the return trip when we would do it again. And that was the experience we all took away from that introduction to hiking. Now, I probably forgot this lesson about pure water after we finished that trek. I used to only think about it when we were on future hikes, which we did many. But then, eight years ago, I got to go to the Holy Land, which was remarkable and we walked where Jesus walked and it was amazing I, I can't read the Bible to this day the same way I did before I went because context isn't just found in books alone no because content true content involves all of our senses that God gifted us with and if you've been there, you, you know that the Sea of Galilee is really the only source of fresh water for the entire country of Israel. And the topography tells us that, it tells us loud and clear when you see it, much of the country is like a, a wilderness. It's nothing but a bunch of stones and, and desert. And life depends on one's access to drinkable water. Maybe a well, maybe a stream in the desert. And you know, you probably know this, that streams in the desert are not uncommon. They'll, they'll bubble up to the surface and they will flow and then they will bubble right back down into the sand. Life depends on one's access to water. Wars in that region have been fought for the source of water. Wells are far and few between and you have those springs that come up every now and then out of the stones but the primary source of potable water in the Holy Land as people scatter out across the country is collected in cisterns that are designed to hold water the only source of cistern water, which is the most common, comes from the rare rainstorms that might come through the area. And it falls over the rocks and it collects in these cisterns and, and there it lasts. Now, think about that water several months down the road when there is no rain. Well... As much as it is necessary for the sustaining of life, the water in them wasn't exactly fresh after very long. It would be full of dirt and bugs, parts of dead animals that happened to be caught in a flood down into the cistern. But that's what they had. At one point, the professor who was serving as our guide was talking about the story of Jesus at the well. We remember this one with the Samaritan woman. 
and he asked her to give him a drink. And she scoffed at him. And he mentioned the fact that he could give her living water. What I didn't know from that story is that living water is a real thing in the Holy Land. Living water, we are told, is not cistern water. It's like the water that is squeezed out of a rock along a mountain wall and it weeps down the side of the rock into whatever vessel it might have to collect it. And it doesn't have flavor. It is tasteless. There's no bitterness. There's no chemical added to it. And when you try to smell it, it smells like hope. <laughs> it's pure. It's coolness. It calms the spirit and the soul. It is the most refreshing thing to experience and to ingest into our bodies. It gives renewal to life itself. Strength that allows the journey of life to continue. And when our lives are, are put into the context of Jesus' words, he's not just talking about something to drink, nor just a random reference to himself. He's talking about what life can be. In chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, from the very beginning, it speaks of the purity and power and light of the life itself. And that life with a capital L is the Word made flesh in Jesus Christ. So we, we, we prepare ourselves this morning to remember Jesus, the one through whom our life comes, especially through these challenging and troubling days. And as we come to the table of our Lord, and we have three sources here and you have your coffee table in front of you or your kitchen table, we come knowing that we are eating this meal with the one we need most in these times, right now. Because we can literally hear his invitation to us. He's saying, as always, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. I am the bread of life, he says to us. The one who comes to me shall never hunger, and the one who believes in me shall never thirst. The one that comes to me I will in no way cast out. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And we come to the table. Amen. And friends, let us now gather our voices together from afar in the unison prayer and preparation for communion that you see on your screen now. Let us pray together. God, God of, of life and, and love, we confess that the body of Christ is not whole. The body is at war with itself, as though our autoimmune response is weakened as we struggle the life out of the innocent, as we vilify those who disagree with us, separating ourselves without a thought of compassion for the other, feasting on fear and hatred and greed, forgetting that we were created for a relationship with you, so that our relationship with others might be filled with hope and strength. You can save us as we mindlessly ravage ourselves. Only you, the great physician, who takes our hopeless case and puts us on the slow journey to recovery through the power of your life-sustaining, healing love. Through this shared meal, come to our side, we pray. Stay, Stay with, with us until, until our fever breaks, our strength returns, 
and, and we, we are, are better. better. The doctor has good news. We have been given more time. We follow the God of the second, third, fourth chance. Through the work of Jesus Christ, we have been saved. Rejoice in our redemption. Resolve to make good use of what you have been given and give the same to others. And the peace of Christ be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. With clean hearts, let us come to the table of the Lord. Loves are broken, words are spoken, as in faith we gather here. Jesus speaks across the ages, I am with you, do not fear. By your On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread as he and his disciples gathered around the table. And he took the bread and he broke it as I, ministering in his name, give it to you, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the meal, when he was still sitting at the table with his disciples with his friends with his family he took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins do this in remembrance of me friends let us pray compassionate God you are good to all help us to trust in you and to share what we have with a hungry world we pray for the earth and all the creatures who look to you for their food in due season may we do our part in restoring the balance of your creation, and deepen our commitment to follow Jesus in ministries that feed and serve others. We boldly pray for all the peoples of the world, that wars will cease, that the hungry will be fed, and that refugees will return home in safety and peace. We pray for all those who are suffering medically, for those who are hurting in their bodies, and also we pray for those who are hurting in their souls. Lord, be a balm and a presence of comfort to those who are grieving this day, to those waiting for test results, yeah. to those who are awaiting answers. This prayer is lifted every week, Lord, and we bring it to you this morning just the same. For everyone whose lives are impacted and turned upside down by the pandemic, be with them. For those who are working on the front lines, be with them. For those who are sick, be with them. For those who are frustrated, and in economic challenges, unemployment, foreclosures, evictions, be with them. For those who have days where the pandemic reality is especially burdensome, be with them. Be with this church family as we continue to worship, practice safe missions, and continue discipleship through technology. Keep us reminded that we are connected across time and space through you and your son. Lord, you are abounding in steadfast love, a love that is continually poured out to us. Continue to journey with us as we speak your praises and bless your name and live as disciples. This we pray as your Son taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord took the bread. Our Lord took the cup. And he said, eat and drink, all of it in remembrance of me.
sisters and brothers in Christ, I invite you to join me in the unison prayer. Let us lift our voices and let us pray. Lord, you are the source and giver of life. May every remembrance of this feast that we have shared serve to unite our spirits with your spirit which gives comfort and life to those who are burdened by circumstances that are beyond our control, and peace to troubled hearts and souls. May we drink from the living water of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ the end Thank you for joining us for this special service of worship today. And I'm glad that we could be a community, part of the body of Christ together in all the technical ways that we use. Pray for one another during the week. Take a drink of water and every day remember the living water that is ours in Christ. So now may the peace of Christ that transcends all of our human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and love of Christ Jesus. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon us and wrap itself around us and fill us with his kind of peace. Amen. Amen.